Thanks, Ryan. Just due to the nature of this talk this afternoon, I want to start off in prayer. So let's, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can gather here together in this place and talk about this serious and, and sobering topic. In many ways, I resonate with Moses when he said uh, that he is slow of speech and of tongue. There must be someone else. Uh, but Lord, would you please uh, be with my mouth and teach me what I shall say this afternoon. Anoint uh, both the, the, the teaching and preaching uh, and the hearing as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Now we live in a time and in a culture where there are myriads and myriads of evils to be concerned about in the world around us. There are many dragons that need to be slayed, if you will. And so we could talk about this afternoon how just in the last decade we've seen the rise in cultural acceptance of transgenderism. We've heard stories of kindergarten classrooms holding transition parties for five-year-old students while kindergarten parents remain in the dark about what's going on in their child's classroom. More and more children at younger and younger ages are coming out as trans due to the popularity that it will bring them oftentimes making their choice to do so a social choice before it is a sexual one. The evil, the dragon of transgenderism, is indeed a large and growing beast. We could talk about the evil of abortion. The ground of our nation is soaked in the blood of the unborn. And yet nobody seems to care and nobody seems to talk about it, at least outside of the church. At least south of the border, there's still a debate. But here in Canada, it's just a foregone conclusion where children can be murdered in their mother's womb right up until birth and for no reason at all. The evil of abortion is a nasty dragon that must be slain. We could talk about the concerns that we have with the rise of anti-Semitism or the untrustworthiness of mainstream media or the problem of mass immigration or the increase in poverty that we're seeing in our country, or the push for globalism, or the rise of political tyranny, or what have you. And all of these issues on various levels are evils that we ought to be concerned about as Christians. But for the most part, all of those problems exist out there. Those problems have not so much infiltrated our churches. Sure, there are exceptions here or there but certainly not on a large scale. And yet there exists another problem, another moral issue that is not just out there, but one that remains a problem in here. It's not only a massively widespread problem in the world, but unfortunately it is a massively widespread problem in the church, and it's the problem, it's the sin, it's the dragon of pornography. We live in a pornified and sex-obsessed culture. You can't walk through the mall or get through the grocery checkout counter or watch a sporting event without being exposed to overly sexualized content. Public school classrooms talk about different sex acts with young children in elementary school. The vast, vast majority of new television shows being put out on Netflix or other tr streaming services are rated TVMA because they contain nudity and graphic sex scenes. And in the midst of such a sex-obsessed culture, we also live in a time of unprecedented technological advancement. The internet, computers, smartphones, virtual reality, artificial intelligence. Everyone in this room has more computing power in their pocket than we would have had that could fill a room a, a few generations ago. A few decades ago, acquiring pornography was not private or anonymous. You would have to go to a convenience store and pick up a magazine from the top shelf and pay a cashier for it, or walk into a gentleman's club. You'd have to leave your house and show your face in a public setting in order to indulge in this sin. But nowadays, it's just the click of a button away. Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines, and usually when we read about that and think about that, we can't imagine how any man could ever sexually sin with that many women, and yet men walk around with larger harems in their pockets. 
And so you put all of that together, you put a sex-obsessed culture with unprecedented technological advancement and the doctrine of total depravity, you put that all into a blender and what do you get? You get a rampant pornography epidemic. One that's not only a problem in the world out there, but one that's a problem that has infiltrated our churches. Referring to this sin as a dragon, I believe, is appropriate because that's what you feel like you're up against when you're trying to kill it. By God's grace, I've been free from pornography for well over a decade now, but this was not the case in my late teens and early 20s. I wish I could stand up here and tell you that this is a sin that was never an issue for me, but I can't. I held out until grade 12, never seeking this sin out or indulging in it, and then one day the dragon got me. And this led to a several years battle against this beast. And so I know personally that battling this dragon, this sin, is like unlike any other. When you're caught in its clutches, it can seem as though there's no way to break free. Uh, free. The shame and the isolation and the anxiety and the despair that this dragon afflicts on its victims can be crippling at times. And so what chance do we have against such a monster? It's a massive, fire-breathing beast, and you're just a measly little mortal and weak human being. What chance do you have? What chance do we have? How can, ever, how can someone ever be freed from its class? Well, that's what we're going to talk about this afternoon. We're going to talk about how to slay the dragon of porn in the church. And as much as that day in grade 12 when I first fell remains probably my single greatest regret in life. I can't think of one larger. I'm here before you today as proof that by God's grace and through the power and presence of Christ, it's possible to defeat this dragon. I'm sure there are many testimonies in this room to that truth. God has given us some significant weapons at our disposal that we can use to slay this dragon in our lives and to help other brothers and sisters in Christ do so in theirs. And so this talk is going to be more geared toward helping others and specifically others in our churches because that's where it needs to start. We need to slay the dragons in the church before we can slay them in society. We need to remove the plank in our own eyes, as Jesus says, before we seek to remove the speck in someone else's. As Pastor James reminded us last night, judgment begins in the household of God. And so, as I said, we've been given various weapons from the Lord in order to do this, in order to break free from its clutches and slay this dragon. And so we're going to discuss those together. For my session this afternoon, I'm going to divide up the material under two headings primarily. So number one, understanding the dragon, and number two, slaying the dragon. Under the first heading, we'll seek to make sure that we understand that which we're trying to kill. In order to defeat an enemy in war, you need to know all that you can about your enemy, how he operates. And then secondly, we're going to look at the tools, the weapons that God has given us to slay this beast. And so here's the first heading. Number one, understanding the dragon. And under this heading, I want to accomplish a few things. I want to consider the severity of the problem. And then I want to ensure... Uh, sorry, I want to ensure that we all realize how widespread of a problem pornography use is. And then I want to look at the devastating effects that it has on both body and soul. So let's begin by looking at some statistics. The Covenant Eyes website has a PDF document that they make freely available that has pages and pages of statistics on this particular issue, and they're quite sobering. In fact, it's hard, as I was preparing this, it's hard not to weep at times. As the psalmist says, he sheds streams of tears because they don't obey your law. These stats come from various studies and surveys conducted over the past 20 years, but most of them come from a report in 2016, a Barna report. Now, interestingly, I think that very report was updated just this past week, eight years later. I wasn't able to, to access it yet, but the headlines say that the stats are worse. So the stats I'm giving you are eight years old. They're worse now, and likely the stats under-report and underestimate the true severity of the problem because they're based on whether the honesty of the, those that are surveyed. And this, so again, this is from the Covenant Eyes website. According to stats from 2018, 
over $3,000 is spent on porn every second. 35% of all internet downloads are porn related. The world's most popular porn site gets over 28 billion visits a year. Okay, that's like everyone in the world visiting it at least three times in a year. Averaging about 81 million visits per day. 50,000 searches per minute are conducted on the website. 3,732 pentabytes of data are transferred from this website a year. So to put that in perspective, that's enough data to fill every iPhone on Earth. And that's just one website. That's just one. Some think porn is a victimless crime, but we know that's not true. There are victims. Think about the so-called actresses. For example, many of them were trafficked into the industry at young ages where they were then groomed. And so as a result, porn actresses have incredibly high rates of substance abuse. 79% use marijuana. 39% use hallucinogens. 50% use ecstasy. One out of every two. 44% use cocaine. 27% use methamphetamine. 26% use tranquilizers. And 10% use heroin. The majority of them have various STDs and experience major depression. Let's look at some of those stats that the 2016 Barna report revealed, which again, new stats came out this week. They're worse than these numbers. 79% of 18 to 30 year old men admit to viewing porn once a month, basically four out of five. 67% of 31 to 49 year olds admit to viewing porn once a month, and 49% of 50 to 68-year-old men. For women, I'll say it in reverse order, 4% of 50 to 68-year-old women uh, admit to viewing porn once a month, 16% of 31 to 49-year-old women, but this shocked me, 76% of 18 to 30-year-old women admit to viewing pornography once a month. Okay, that... that that's almost on par with men now. That tells me the problem is growing, and it's worsening with each new generation, such that now it's not predominantly a problem for men, but a problem for men and women, at least in the younger generation. 55% of married men say they watch porn at least once a month, compared to 70% of unmarried men. For married women, that number is 25%, and for unmarried women, it's 16%, so it's still lower overall. 90% of teens and 96% of young adults are either encouraging, accepting, or neutral when they talk about porn with their friends. The majority, so 56% of teens and young adults aged 13 to 24, believe that not recycling is far worse than viewing pornography. About half, so 54% of daily porn users say that porn featuring teens is wrong. Only one in two believe that it's wrong which means one and two are okay with it. 27% of people 25 to 30 indicate that they started looking at porn before puberty. 57% of teens admit to seeking out porn at least monthly. But as I said earlier, the problem is not just out there. The problem is in here. 41% of practicing Christian boys aged 13 to 24, so the stats divide practicing with just those that self-identify, so I'll give both. 41% of practicing Christian boys aged 13 to 24 admit to using porn at least once a month. 23% of practicing Christian men, 25 or over, use porn at least once a month. 64% of self-identified Christian men and 15% of self-identified Christian women view porn at least once a month. 28% of Christian men say that they were first exposed to porn before the age of 12. And here's, here's a shocking one. According to this 2016 report, one in five youth pastors and one in seven senior pastors admit to using porn on a regular basis and are currently struggling, which amounts to more than 50,000 U.S. church leaders. And I think the numbers are worse, again, in the report that just came out. And this is those who admit it. According to the research, prolonged exposure to pornography leads to an exaggerated perception of sexual activity in society, 
diminished trust between intimate couples, the abandonment of the hope of sexual monogamy, belief that promiscuity is the natural state, belief that abstinence and sexual inactivity are unhealthy, cynicism about love or the need for affection between sexual partners, belief that marriage is sexually confining, and a lack of desire to have a family and raise children. There's a lot of speculation about why our birth rate is so low. It's probably because of how many people are hooked on porn. I could go on, but I think I'll stop there. The report was 43 pages long. It's depressing to read through. It's just statistic after statistic after statistic shedding light on just how massive and widespread of an issue this is, both in the world and in the church. So that helps us understand the nature of this dragon on a macro level. Let's consider it on a micro level, how it affects the individual. As Christians, we know that God has made us to have both bodies and souls. We are body and soul creatures, such that our bodies affect our souls and our souls affect our bodies. Well, the sin of pornography is a sin that drastically affects both the body and the soul. We'll begin by discussing the effects that it has on the body and why it can so quickly cause addiction. And it aligns with what the scriptures say. Romans 6 verse 12 says that sin is able to reign in your mortal body and make you obey its passions. Verse 13 says that it can present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness. And then verse 19 says that your members can be presented as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, which leads to more lawlessness. In other words, sin reigns in one's mortal body, and as it does so, it leads to more and greater sin. Lawlessness leads to more lawlessness, and certainly we see this with the sin of pornography. So I want to read an excerpt uh, for you from Joe Rigney's book, More Than a Battle. Phenomenal book, I would commend it to you, in dealing with the sin of lust and pornography. He discusses in it how pornography affects the body and in particular the brain. This is what he writes. Essentially, pornography rewires the brain. The brain is what scientists call plastic. It's capable of being shaped and molded and then of holding that new shape over time. Brain plasticity is particularly high during one's teenage years. As we age, our brains become less malleable. Given that many men first encounter porn as teenagers, it's no surprise that they become hooked and find it difficult to break the habit as they get older. Porn weaponizes the brain so that sin is easy and obedience is hard. Looking at pornography triggers neurological, chemical, and hormonal events that leave a mark on the brain. Frequent use hardens the neural pathways and molds the brain so that it craves porn. Of course, this isn't unique to porn. Alcohol, drugs, video games, smartphones, food, all of these can do the same. But porn is somewhat unique in that it is a polydrug, meaning it is both an upper, a dopamine high like cocaine, and a downer, an opiate release like heroin. The porn high that builds up to a climax and then the porn crash that occurs afterward is then a potent and addictive drug unlike any other, end quote. Rigney then goes on to explain how the chemicals and the hormones that are released during these upper and downer stages are responsible for storing memory of what caused the euphoric sensation. So essentially, the brain takes a snapshot of the events leading up to and during the climax and then binds the brain to that sequence of events. And so when a man is with his wife, you can see the beauty of God's design in this, how this is a good thing. The snapshots taken in his mind then bind the man to his wife and creates a close connection between his body and hers in those circumstances. But sin distorts that bodily design such that when a man looks at porn in the dark, alone, in front of his computer, at night, his brain is now bound to that sequence of events such that every time he finds himself in that kind of a situation in the dark, alone, in front of his computer at night, even if porn is not on his mind at all, the man's body will start being drawn in that direction because his brain has been rewired through his past porn use. 
And so his brain recalls those mental snapshots that it's stored and starts sending signals to the rest of his body, causing the temptation to rapidly build. And so you can understand how patterns and habits can so easily and quickly develop and why someone can become so easily enslaved to this dragon. Romans 6.19 is then fulfilled. Lawlessness leads to more lawlessness. The body is under its power. That's a brief overview of the effects of this sin on the body, but I want to briefly talk about the effects of this sin on the soul. And there are many. Addictions and pornography in particular lead to all kinds of other sins and issues. It leads to increased despair, anxiety, depression, seared consciences, enslavement, doubt, unbelief, fear, dishonesty, loneliness. We could go on. We could talk about each one of these all afternoon. But for the sake of time, there's one effect that I want to especially highlight before we, we move on, and it's this one, shame. Shame. 1 Corinthians 6, 13b-20 says this, The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And God raised the Lord and will also raise us by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside of his body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. Now, there's a lot of talk about the body here in this passage, and I know I said we're talking about the soul, but I think it, it speaks to the uniqueness of sexual sin. Paul says in verse 18, every other sin a person commits is outside of the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. And so there's a uniqueness to sexual sin like pornography that also brings with it a unique form of shame. While all sin leads to shame on some level, the shame that accompanies these unique sins against the body is the strongest kind of shame. Adam and Eve, after they ate of the tree, the first thing that they felt was shame over their nakedness. And so they sewed fig leaves to hide it. So the sight of nakedness and the viewing of pornography brings a profound sense of shame. We know it's wrong. I want to note, though, that this shame is actually a good thing. While the shame seems to have a crushing effect on the soul, it's been designed by God to drive the person toward repentance and change. It's meant to, and designed to crush the soul until it produces truly godly sorrow. Herman Bavink points this out when commenting on the shame that Adam and Eve felt after they ate of the fruit. He writes this, if immediately after the transgression, a sense of guilt, shame, and fear arose in humans, then that in itself is already an operation of God's Spirit in them. Indeed, a revelation of His wrath, but also of His grace. A revelation that is the foundation of all the religious and ethical life that still persists in humans after the fall. Shame in this way was God's grace toward Adam and Eve. They weren't desensitized to their sin, but rather they recognized it and they sought to do something about it. Their shame led to change. Uh, Tim Bailey in his book, The Grace of Shame, says this about shame. And that, shame, that, that book is about the sin of homosexuality, but it is, a, it is a phenomenal book. It's called The Grace of Shame. He writes this about shame. He says, because shame is painful, our desire to avoid it keeps us from sin. God gave us physical pain to protect our bodies and shame to protect our souls. A man incapable of physical pain runs the risk of destroying his own body. In the same way, a shameless man risks destroying his own soul. 
cannot be said too often that shame is God's grace. And so this kind of shame is good. There are bad kinds of shame, but this kind of shame is good because it ultimately is meant to drive us to the Lord Jesus Christ in confession and in repentance. That he is the only one that provides a way out of our shame and that can take it away. And so the more we're crushed by our shame, the more we're motivated to flee to Christ because he is the only one that can cleanse and transform us so that sin and shame no longer reign in our souls and in our bodies. And so that's understanding the dragon. It's widespread out there in here. It affects both body and soul in profound ways. Number two, here's the second heading, slaying the dragon. And under this, we'll have several subheadings as we look at the different tools and weapons that God has given us to slay this beast. Here's the first weapon. A, extreme measures. Extreme measures. When I first meet with a guy that is trying to kill this sin in his life, the first thing that I do is chat with them about the kind of what kind of extreme measures they have taken to put some distance between them and their sin. And if they haven't taken any, then we we talk through which ones uh, they could consider taking. And so the goal with this is twofold. Number one, you want to make it as difficult as possible for them to have access to porn and to give in to it. And number two, you want to gauge how serious they are about killing their sin. So giving them some homework in the form of an extreme measure that they can take achieves both of those goals. Put some distance and difficulty between them and their sin, and it helps you gauge how serious they are about killing it. And not only that, this is a biblical concept. So God's, God's way is always the best way. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 29 to 30, he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. So what is Jesus saying there? He's telling you to do whatever it takes to kill your sin. And he's speaking in particular to those who are struggling with sexual sin. We know that from the context of this passage. And so often we come to this passage and we want to instantly caveat it. So we read the passage to someone and we say, well, surely Jesus doesn't literally mean to gouge out our eye or cut off our hand. Why are we so quick to say that? Jesus doesn't caveat what he says. So why don't we just let the shock of the passage have its full effect? His point is to be as extreme as possible in killing your sin. Make it as difficult as possible for you to sin. And so again, I've found that this is a great starting point in helping someone kill this sin. They can cry and they can mourn and they can pray and they should mourn over their sin and they should pray, but at some point they have to get practical. I've heard Pastor Jacob say on occasion, he said, the best way to kill the flesh is to starve it. I think that's helpful. So let's help them make porn as inaccessible as possible so that they can begin to starve the dragon. Cut off access to the food source. Joe Rigney explains again in his book, More Than a Battle, he says the basic idea is to establish artificial boundaries in relation to sexual temptation. This makes it possible for the deeper issues of the heart to surface without gasoline constantly being poured on the fire. More often it means identifying the access point for the temptation and completely removing it. So earlier this year I met with someone who was struggling with porn on his smartphone. He didn't have a computer. He just had a smartphone, so I told him, get rid of it. Buy a flip phone that only allows you to call and text. They still exist. And so that's what he did. He traded in his smartphone for a dumb phone. Now, some people are hesitant to do this because they think they need their smartphone. Well, they certainly don't need it as much as their hands and eyes. Heath Lambert, in his book, Finally Free, which is another wonderful book on this topic, he says, The honest truth is that you don't need any electronic device, but you do need to be holy. The inconvenience will be worth the gain in holiness. In other words, it's better to go to heaven with a dumb phone than hell with a smartphone. 
If they're unwilling to part with their smartphone, then that tells me that they're not serious yet, uh, serious enough yet about killing their sin. And so you can see how this functions as a test to gauge how serious they are. Other boundaries that can be set include deleting your social media accounts, no internet use or streaming services alone, put your computer in a public space and never allow it behind a closed door, or better yet, get rid of your computer and use someone else's, or go to the library if you ever need to use one. Uh, One of the elders told me about one guy in our church a couple years ago who was seeking to kill this sin. And the drastic measure he decided to do was take his bedroom door off his doorframe. I thought that was amazing. So he has no privacy. He didn't want any privacy, and so he removed the door to his room. Now, a a brief word on filtering and accountability software. I, I think it's useful, but the majority of the time, I don't think it's extreme enough. So if someone tells me that they put software on their phone, I tell them that's good, but I want them to think of something more extreme. Software on their devices is akin to trimming one's fingernails. It's doing something, but it's nowhere near cutting off their hand. And so the goal here with this extreme measure is to be practical, to be radical, and to put as much distance and difficulty as possible between the sinner and their sin, and then to gauge how serious they are about killing it. And God honors these actions. The ones who are like, I'll do whatever it takes, and comes back and does the homework, they have far more success than the ones that don't. God honors these actions. When someone demonstrates in word and in deed that they desire holiness more than their privacy or their personal freedom or the, the convenience of their technology, God blesses that. And so that's the first one, extreme measures. Secondly, B, confession and accountability. In order to kill sin, it has to be brought into the light. There's no other way. Proverbs 29 verse 13 says, Whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. Why would you ever not confess? 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And James 5.16 says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. So I want you to notice that this step, confession and accountability, involves both vertical and horizontal confession. First, we must encourage people to confess their sin to the Lord immediately. According to Proverbs 29, verse 13, and 1 John 1, 9, confession is the only pathway to God's mercy and forgiveness and his cleansing grace. God will never, ever, ever withhold forgiveness from someone who genuinely confesses their sin to him. What a wonderful truth. Every time he will be faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse the unrighteousness. But confession of sin also has a horizontal component as well. Sin is first and foremost against God, but it is also against others. And so a married man or woman ought to confess this sin to their spouse. A guy being held accountable by others should confess this sin to the group of guys holding him accountable. Sin loves to thrive in the dark, but when you bring it into the light, it begins to wither. And so it's important that we create contexts for men and for women where they can bring sin into the light and practice James 5.16, which commands us to confess our sins to one another. How many churches actually practice that one another command of Scripture? How many churches actually have contexts within them in which it is normal for men and women to confess their sin to each other? The primary context that we have in our church for this to happen is, a, is our small groups ministry. And so we've seen many guys over the years overcome the sin of pornography primarily through their involvement in the small group ministry. Our small groups consist of about 12 to 14 men and women, mixed gender, 18 years or older, so intergenerational, who meet together once a week for about two hours. Each meeting consists of Bible study and discussion. That's about the first half, the first hour. And then the second half is accountability and prayer. 
So for the first hour, we discuss God's Word together, usually discussing the passage that was preached on Sunday and how it applies to our lives. And then after that time is over, the men break off with the men and the women break off with the women, and we have a time of intentional accountability and prayer together. This time is designed to be a place to talk about our relationship with God, what God is doing in our life, and to confess sin with one another. That's part of its stated purpose. And so we have some accountability resources on our website that leaders can use to facilitate this time. If you go to the small groups page on our website, you can find those there. These are question sets that leaders can use to have their members answer during accountability. So in my accountability time each week, what my small group focuses on is three things. Number one, our relationship with the Lord. How was your time in God's Word this week? How was your time in prayer? Number two, our sexual purity. How are things going in the area of purity? And number three, our family relationships. So how's your marriage? How are things going with your children and parenting? Uh, university students, I have some in my group. They'll talk about their relationship with their parents and how they're doing at fulfilling the fifth commandment. But all that to say, every week we check in with one another to see how purity is going in particular. And so this gives an opportunity for guys in our church every single week. They have an opportunity to bring their sin into the light. And it fosters and it cultivates relationships of accountability with other men in the church that can then come alongside of them and encourage them and hold them accountable. One of the stats, I didn't give it in the Barna report, was how many men say that they don't have anyone holding them accountable. It was like 80 to 90%. But in our church, if you're in a small group, you know exactly who you can go to for help as a first line of defense. After a time of sharing and accountability, we then have a time of prayer together where we bring one another's needs before the throne of grace to find mercy and help <clears throat> in our time of need, Hebrews 4.16. And so the small groups ministry has been an invaluable resource for men and women seeking to slay this dragon. Now, I, I could make a biblical case for having a small groups ministry if you don't have that, but I believe that's beyond the scope of this session. I did teach on that at the Church at War conference a couple of years ago, though, so you could always look that up. But I want to impress upon you, small groups are not only biblical, but they're so practical. They equip the saints for the work of the ministry, and if you run them similar to how we do, they create these accountability structures within your church and within the body of Christ where confession can take place, and brothers and sisters can hold one another accountable and live out James 5, 16, and uh, Galatians 6, verse 1, which says, brothers... If anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore them in a spirit of gentleness. How does that lived out? We need to create structures where those can be lived out, those one and others of Scripture. C, here's the third thing, imitable leaders. I thought the word was imitatable, but Word, Microsoft Word kept underlining it. So it's, it's actually imitable. That means leaders worth imitating. In order for this small group model to work, you need to have leaders that are qualified to lead. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. And so among other qualifications at our church, we have developed a zero tolerance pornography policy for all of our leaders. Meaning we only have people in positions of leadership, including small group leadership, who are currently free from the sin of pornography. And so if you want to slay the dragon of porn in your church, then it has to start with the leadership. Slay this dragon amongst your leadership. And then it will trickle down from there. I remember when I was in university, being part of uh, university discipleship groups led by other students. That all struggled with the same sins. And so there was very little hope and encouragement in that. Whereas when a young man joins a small group at church, now all of a sudden they've got older men in their life and mature leaders who have previously slayed this dragon or others who can now come alongside of them and truly help them and offer them hope. So you want to have imitable leaders. Fourth, D, faithful preaching. Faithful preaching. As a university student, I still remember the first fall that we launched a bus ministry. I was a student at Laurier, and a bunch of us got on the bus, and we headed to church, Trinity Bible Chapel. At that point, it was Harvest Bible Chapel. And Pastor Jacob happened to be in Proverbs 5 to 7, speaking on the adulterous woman. 
And he's an intense preacher now, but he was even rougher around the edges when, when I first uh, sat under his preaching. And so he just railed against sexual sin and pornography in his preaching over those few weeks. And afterwards, on the bus ride home, we all discussed how it cut us to the heart and it motivated us to pursue change. We hadn't heard, pre we hadn't heard preaching like that before. That's what we needed. There's something about the spiritual power that is unleashed through the faithful preaching of God's word that the Spirit uses to bring about change and transformation in the lives of his people. We've all experienced it before, I'm sure, where the word of God is being faithfully exposited and it feels as though the Holy Spirit is speaking directly to you. And the thoughts and the intentions of your heart are being laid bare. Your sin is being exposed and a burning desire in your heart to change begins to set in. That's the effect of faithful preaching. And so I just want to say I'm so thankful that I have a senior pastor that regularly preaches against the sin of pornography. He's not afraid to name sins in his preaching and boldly call people to change. That's had a dramatic effect in my life and the, life, uh, the lives of many others. Jeremiah 23, verse 29 says, Is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? So the word of God is the power to break this dragon into pieces. And so this sin needs to be called out and preached against from the pulpit when the application is appropriate. When this happens regularly, it will drive this sin out of the church. When it's preached against from the pulpit. I think it'll drive it out in one of two ways. Number one, people who are struggling with this sin will be genuinely convicted by the Holy Spirit and it will motivate them to change. Or number two, they will feel too uncomfortable sitting under that kind of preaching week in and week out and so eventually they'll go somewhere else. But either way, the porn is driven out of the church. In Acts 2, after the people sat under the faithful preaching of Peter, in which he calls out their sin, it says this in verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? That's the response that we're going for. The faithful, prophetic preaching of God's word is one of the most powerful weapons that we've been given to slay this dragon. All right, next, E, a church discipline. I don't think this weapon, this weapon, church discipline, is talked about enough in conversations about pornography. In fact, I have yet to read a book about the sin of pornography that mentions church discipline. And in no way am I insinuating that when a guy confesses to looking at porn, we need to immediately go nuclear and excommunicate him from the church. No. But eventually, if that sin persists without any change or movement toward righteousness, then church discipline, excommunication, should be on the table. Church discipline is a tool that God has given the church for the purpose of saving sexual sinners from damnation. And speaking of the sexually immoral man in the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians 5, Paul writes in verses 4 to 5, When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. And so every situation is different, and matters of church discipline should be discussed amongst a plurality of elders. There's safety in many counselors, the Bible says. But eventually, if someone persists in this sexual sin, in the sin of pornography, without any change, at some point, we have to conclude that they are not repentant and that perhaps the sting of church discipline is what they need to help them snap out of it and pursue repentance once and for all. And so earlier this year, I was sitting with a guy in my office who had applied for church membership but had also been struggling for porn for years without any change, no movement in the right direction. So there was no evidence that he was taking his sin seriously and there was seemingly no victory over it. So I told him that we had discussed his situation as elders and due to his sin, we would not be accepting him into membership at that point because if we did, it would immediately become a matter of church discipline. Now this was a shock to his system. I don't think he was expecting that. 
And after that meeting, he ended up taking some radical measures in his life that he previously had not done to finally begin to slay the dragon. And so the means that God has given us in his word worked. For him, just the thought or prospect of excommunication was enough to sting him toward repentance. I think that sometimes because this sin is so widespread and it's so easy to fall into and so many men are enslaved by it, we, we don't take it as seriously as other sins. But it is serious. It's sexual sin. It's sin against the body. And so if someone persists in it without any change, which means they're persisting in it unrepentantly because repentance means change, then this is the tool that God has given us to deal with it. Next, I want to just kind of rapid fire through a few more things under the heading honorable mentions. So F, honorable mentions. Fathers are responsible for protecting their homes from this sin. I believe that the previous generation of parents, my, my parents' generation, they were naive to what was happening on the computers in their homes because the internet was new. It caught them off guard. There was a lot of ignorance. That's not the case anymore. Okay, we're not ignorant to the prevalence of this sin. So get filtering and accountability software on your family computer. Make sure your family computer is in a public place. Don't give your kids smartphones or iPads until you know they're mature enough in the faith to handle them. Maybe even add a few years on to that. And when you do, use software as a safeguard while they're under your roof. But generally speaking, I would just hold off on giving them devices for as long as you can. Tim Challies has this great blog post saying, don't give them porn for Christmas. He's talking about how a lot of devices we give our kids as gifts are, are gateways to porn even video game systems. So don't be ignorant to that. Fathers, you're, uh, it's your responsibility. I mentioned that pastors should faithfully preach against this sin. I'll also mention the flip side of that, that pastors should preach about the gift and the beauty of sex the way that it was meant to be enjoyed. Christians should be taught a holy view of sex, that it is a wonderful gift that God has given us when enjoyed in the proper context. Sometimes, and I've I've sort of come to understand this through premarital counseling sessions, people that have come from other churches. Sometimes we focus so much on the problem of sex when it's not enjoyed in the proper context that people end up thinking that sex is a shameful thing in general, that it's always shameful. Well, that's not a good view of sex either. And so when a teenager's hormones start to rage and they have desires for sex, they aren't sure what to do. Because they've grown up thinking those desires must be wrong. They're unnatural. But of course, they're not. They're not unnatural. They just need to be mastered. And they need to find their fulfillment in marriage. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, 9, it's better to marry than to burn with passion. So let's preach about the beauty of sex in its proper context and the beauty of marriage. Scripture memory is another means of fighting this dragon. David says in Psalm 119, verse 13, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. So encourage brothers and sisters to memorize scripture that deals directly with their sin. And so when they feel the temptation coming on, tell them, go for a walk and just recite the scripture over and over. Pray through the scriptures that you've memorized that directly attack and speak to this sin. And so I would suggest as a starting point, Matthew 5, 8, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 to 11, 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 8. There are many passages that apply. I like Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Would you rather see that filth, or would you rather see God? The last honorable mention that I'll give is that we shouldn't be afraid to speak strongly to those who are engaged in this sin. Bring up warning passages like the ones in Hebrews to warn them about the consequences of persisting in sin. Another thing you can do, and this would have been motivating to me as a young man, if someone had said this to me, is bluntly tell guys that struggle with this sin that they're being effeminate. That doesn't mean they're being feminine. It's not feminine to look at porn, but they're being effeminate. Looking at porn is effeminate. In other words, it's not acting like a man. Men are called to lead women, not prey upon them. Men are called to protect women, not objectify them. 
Men are called to have self-control and self-mastery. And so to indulge in porn then is the opposite of what they're called to do. Therefore, it's effeminate. It's malakoi. So don't be afraid to refer to it as such and get serious with the people that you're seeking to help. Use biblical language. So those were some honorable mentions, and there's many more we could talk about. But we'll finish with this one. G, the presence of Christ. All of the tools that we have discussed so far are completely useless if they're not empowered by the presence and the power of Jesus Christ. They are useful means that God has given us to slay the dragon, but we must remember that they are means to be used, not trusted in. They cannot save or deliver. Our trust for salvation and deliverance is only in Jesus Christ. And Jesus is pretty clear in John 15, 5. He says, apart from me, you can do nothing. That is pretty conclusive. Here we have another statement of Jesus without any caveats. Apart from him, you can do nothing. You cannot overcome sexual sin without Jesus Christ. And you cannot help others overcome sexual sin without Jesus Christ. But the good news is that, that no matter how intense or how frequent or how long-standing the struggle is, Jesus Christ is in the business of setting people free from this sin. He's in the business of washing and sanctifying and justifying his people in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians 6.11 He's in the business of setting people free. And so as we help others in the church slay this dragon, we must regularly bring them back to Jesus. Remind them of his gospel grace. And one of the ways I think we can practically ensure that they are abiding in Christ is by holding them accountable to spend time with the Lord Jesus in his word and in prayer. Oftentimes, if a guy's regularly indulging in porn, he's not regularly indulging in his Bible or praying to the Lord. And so teach them to abide in Christ. This past week in my small group, someone shared that they had looked at porn recently and unsurprisingly, their devotions during that time were, were non-existent. There's no power apart from the vine. But if they're starting and ending every day intentionally spending time with the Lord Jesus, that's going to drastically infuse their lives with power in the fight against sin. Apart from him, you can do nothing. Scottish pastor Robert Robert Murray McChain, he said this, this is a well-known quote, Learn much of the Lord Jesus. For every look at yourself, take ten looks at Christ. He is altogether lovely, such infinite majesty and yet such meekness and grace, and all for sinners, even the chief. Live much in the smiles of God, bask in his beams, feel his all-seeing eye settled on you in love and repose in his almighty arms. Let your soul be filled with a heart-ravishing sense of the sweetness and excellency of Christ and all that is in him. Let the Holy Spirit fill every chamber of your heart so that there will be no room for folly or the world or Satan or the flesh, end quote. And so the ultimate remedy for sin, the ultimate weapon for slaying this dragon, it is the presence of Christ. The more of Christ that we have in our hearts, the less room that we have for sin. It's really that simple. The more we desire him, the less we'll desire sin. The more we're satisfied in him, the less we'll look for satisfaction elsewhere. The more we abide in him, the more fruit of righteousness we will bear. It's not your power, it's not you. It's Christ's power and Christ in you. And so we need him if we're going to be released from the clutches of this sin. After all, Christ is the great dragon slayer, amen? He is the one who bled and died on the cross in the place of porn addicts and sexual sinners, not only to purchase their salvation, but also to crush the head of their greatest enemy in keeping with the promise that God gave to the, our first parents back in the garden. And though our wounded enemy is still prowling around like a roaring lion seeking those he would try to devour, Isaiah 27 verse 1 assures us that in that day the Lord will, the Lord with his hand and his heart and great and strong sword will punish Leviathan, the fleeing serpent. 
Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and he will slay the dragon that is in the sea. May that day come soon. And so I want to close by reading this excerpt from Andy Nassali uh, in his book titled The Serpent and the Serpent Slayer. How should you feel when you think about what Jesus, the serpent slayer, has already done to the dragon and about what the serpent slayer is, uh, will finally do to the dragon? You should feel elated. You should fall on your knees to worship the ultimate knight in shining armor, the ultimate dragon slayer. It's epic when the good guys courageously defeat Sauron or Voldemort, but that's just a shadow compared with the greatest defeat of all time. Jesus slays the dragon. If that doesn't make you rejoice, what will? Exalt in the serpent slayer. I think that's a good note to end on, so let's pray. Father, we pray to you with hearts full of thanksgiving and worship for your son, Jesus Christ, the great serpent slayer who has crushed the head of Satan and will will one day fully slay him once and for all. We pray that 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 day would come soon and very soon. Until then, Lord, would you please root this terrible sin of pornography out of our churches? Would you give us spiritual power from on high for such a task? Lord, if there's anyone in the room who's currently struggling with this sin right now, I pray that you would grant them freedom. I pray that the last time they looked at porn would be the last time that they ever look at it that you would give them a far greater desire for the Lord Jesus Christ and for his presence than they would have a desire for sin. Please, O oh Lord, free them. And Lord, for the rest of us, would you help us as we seek to minister to others who are caught in this sin? Oh Lord, again, give us power from on high that we would use the means that you have granted and given to us in your word. And Lord, that we would be able to reverse this tide by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.